Uh, Jesus, we marvel uh, that you are the word from the beginning. You became flesh, uh, became like us, dwelt among us, and showed us uh, who the Father is. Thank you, Jesus. Help us be uh, renewed and encouraged by this truth once again this morning. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please be seated. Well, we are in the midst of a five-week preaching series called Sharing God and His Message. And yes, sometimes at church we use the words evangelism, gospel, but I also want us to think about really what it, the essence of it, what does it mean to actually share God and His message with others? And we all have probably different thoughts and experience uh, with evangelism or sharing the gospel. I remember uh, after my undergrad, I was uh, sp spending some time in Austria and Europe, and we did a missions trip to Italy. And uh, we were sent there as a mission trip and to do different types of evangelism. And I don't speak, uh, spoiler alert, I don't speak Italian. <laughs> so we would go around, and in Italy, a lot of the big cities or small cities, there's a main square where everyone would hang out. And honestly, usually the major church or cathedral, those steps where people would sit all day, they would talk, they would eat, all sorts of things happened on those steps. And one of the things we were challenged to do at that time was just to ask people, do you know who God is? Are you a Christian? And uh, then we'd have very funny conversations about Catholic versus Christian <laughs> uh, and things like that. But uh, it was one of my formative experiences to think of how do we actually share God in his message? And as I shared those few words with people, and many people, we would just talk for five, ten minutes, and I would leave. I often wonder about how do we share God and his message? And how do we as a church now do this here in Vancouver, Canada? So for some of you who may miss some weeks, let me do a brief recap of where we've come. Out of the five weeks, we began by thinking there is a message, we are messengers. And what did we mean by that? Christianity at its core does have a message. And if you're sitting here today, in some way, shape, or form, you have been a recipient of the message of who God is and his message. And we saw that anytime Jesus gave the message to others, he also turned around and said, hey, you are messengers too. So there is a message, and we are messengers. And that was exciting. We were grateful, and maybe a little scary to think that we are messengers. But part two, we thought about, well, there's actually a big M messenger and a big M man. That is, at the core of evangelism, sharing God and outreach, is God himself. Evangelism is not a to-do list item for Christians. It is to actually point other people to who God is and to realize that at the center of this whole Christian message, and if people say, oh, the Bible, I have no idea how to read that, you can say this book is about Jesus. And Jesus is the messenger. He is the man at the center of it all. And, uh, and I even suggested one of the ways we could talk to our neighbors and friends would be simply to say, why do you think people have followed Jesus for 2,000 years? Why do you think the church is still around? And that would be a way for them to remember at the center of this message is the person of Jesus. Well, today we're looking at part three, which is, I've entitled, Embodying the Message. Embodying the Message. Okay? Uh, but what I want to start with is a controversial Christian quote to begin with, a controversial statement. Let me read this to you. This is from St. Francis of Assisi, 12th century. Preach the gospel at all times. And, when necessary, use words. Let me read it again. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. In 20 seconds, you have a vote to make. First vote is, I generally like this quote. I generally agree with this quote. Or you can vote, uh, I don't know, I'm not quite that comfortable with this quote. I kind of lean towards disagreeing with this quote. Okay? It's a bit of a controversial statement. Give you guys a couple seconds to think about how you're going to vote. And I'm watching you. Okay, I do expect most of you to vote, right? Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Vote number one. Who thinks, oh, I haven't thought about this long, but I generally like this quote and kind of agree with it. Okay, well, I guess 30 to 40 percent. Okay, others, mm, I don't know about this quote. I kind of lean towards disagreeing with it. Okay, oh, a few hands. Okay, okay. Well, it seems like vote one won by a little bit. 
Well, if you haven't read St. Francis of Assisi, he's uh, one of the very uh, famous uh, Christian saints uh, through the history. And if you know Pope Francis, actually, he took that name following after uh, St. Francis. And let's think a little bit about this quote, because I do think it is controversial. And so let's consider both views on this quote, if we were to support it on one hand or not support it on the other hand. So let's imagine on one hand, yes, hmm, I think there is some truth to saying Actions can speak louder than words. And perhaps one very common complaint against Christians is, oh, Christians, you say this, you say that, you read the Bible, whatever, but your lives look completely different. Are our lives a bad witness compared to the message of who God is? And so on one hand, I'm a bit inclined to agree partially with this quote, because if we are Christians and we are his disciples, we bear the name of Jesus. To say I'm a Christian, I bear the name of Christ. We wear a cross, we go to church. I think we do have to be aware that our message can sometimes speak louder than our words. That is, the way we preach the gospel is not just words. And that can be a little bit scary. We all are human. None of us will perfectly reflect the teaching and life of Jesus. But I think St. Francis here has something important to say. Is Maybe he is pointing out that Christians can sometimes be hypocritical, or contradict what the true message of God is. For example, us as Canadians, I think it can be very challenging if the U.S. claims to be a Christian nation, and we wonder, what do their actions speak? And if we, (laughs) I mean, it's easier to point fingers at others, but if we're going to be a Christian church, we also have to look very carefully and think about how do we live our lives? Maybe a lot of people hear a lot from us, not just from our words, but our actions and the way we live our lives. So on one hand, I think, oh, yeah, I think St. Francis is on to something. Well, let's think about, on the other hand, no. Well, St. Francis says, when necessary, use words. And I might say to St. Francis, it is necessary to use words. And our part one of our sermon series was Christianity at its core does have a message. And something as simple as there is a God who loves you. I think these words, very, very short. It's not the whole Bible but is a very, very important message that a lot of people no longer believe that could be very powerful to others. Uh, The passage that uh, Nathaniel read us from Isaiah uh, read this. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. I think when we hear that, we have to understand that Christianity at its core does have a message, and it is good news. And so you might say, oh, St. Francis, I don't know if I quite agree with the quote, but let's Continue on. What does this good news mean? He has sent me uh, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What's saying here is not just empty words. The power of the gospel is going to play out in our real world and have very real consequences. So people who are oppressed over time, whether from slavery, racism, or when women were oppressed, this meant actual good news to them. There was actually liberty to the captives. For the brokenhearted, this actually meant something tangible. And so on the other hand, I do need to disagree partially with St. Francis and say, no, there's actually a real message, but the real message does have real consequences and actions too. So in some ways, this Bible passage supports and disagrees with what St. Francis says. And what's so interesting uh, near the end of this passage says, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord, and they shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. That is, each one of us, we call ourselves Christians. We do reflect, we do communicate the message of who God is and what his message is, whether we're aware of it or not. I know many people say, oh, Alan, you're a pastor as you wear a collar. But no, a pastor is just partly as a priest, a picture of what we all are called to reflect who Jesus is and his message. And his promise in Isaiah says that you shall, all of us, be called the priests of the Lord. And brothers and sisters, that is what we are called to. And so with this controversial quote, like most controversial quotes, I wouldn't say it's all one or the other. But I think St. Francis does make an important point to us, which is to go beyond just mere words and to think about how does the message of God actually live out 
And for this part three, when we think about embodying the message, that's what the word kind of embody means. To have words is one thing, but to actually have flesh, have actions, to have consequences, the way our words play out is extremely important in our faith and is actually at the core of Christianity. So let's look at our gospel reading today, which I consider the gospel of John's epic opening, also called uh, the prologue. Now, there's many, many different ways to read the Bible, and this passage you've probably heard many different times. And since the Bible is so deep, it's like this diamond with like, you know, 100 different little edges and angles. And one really helpful exercise when we read the Bible is actually to consider a different angle of that. So, for example, you might say, oh, I really want to know what God's character is like. You could read the whole Bible cover to cover with that question of mine. What is God's character like? Alternatively, you could think of, what does it mean to be God's people? And you could read cover to cover thinking of all the different people throughout history. But since these five weeks, we're going through the sermon series, sharing God and his message. I want you to hear this passage with that lens in mind. As I'm reading this passage, what does this have to do with sharing God in his message? Okay, So let's look at uh, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Let's slow down a little bit through this passage and consider what's going on here. Well, actually, I think this one slide actually encapsulates all first three parts of our five-part series that we've been thinking about, because we've been thinking about, oh, there is a message, and we are messengers. Well, how do we see this in our passage? In the beginning was the Word. Uh, here, John is saying, at the essence, there is a message, there's a meaning, there's a, a purpose of the whole universe and everything. Uh, there is a message at the very beginning of things. And this message is the big M, the big M God, um, the original creator of all things. And so we read this very first line, in the beginning was a word, and the word was God. The word was with God, and the word was God. It actually really sums up our first two sermons that we talked about. At the core of Christianity is a God with a message for us. When we think about how are we messengers, we find out, well, God actually sends out people all the time to be messengers. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. And so this also reminds us, not only does God have a message at his core, you and I are called to be witnesses. And all that may feel like a lot of pressure, we're reminded, hey, this John, he was not the light. He just came to bear witness about the light. And so you and I, as flawed and as vulnerable human beings we are, we point to who God is. We point to the cross. We point to Jesus and say, we are simply messengers towards who God is. And we find out this message is actually something amazing. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Brothers and sisters, in our dark world, we actually get to say to the world, there is light, there is life, and it's found in who Jesus is. And that's wonderful, wonderful good news. Now, if we go to the second half of this passage, uh, oh, let me, uh, sorry, go to the second half of this passage. Let's read a little bit more about what happens with this light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. We find out there is great light that enters the darkness, but there is a battle between the light and darkness. And many actually choose not to believe in Jesus and not to follow in the light. And so we do remind ourselves whenever we share God and his message, we do have good news and bad news. There is darkness in the world. And the thing is, we continue to watch the situation in Israel and Gaza. We just hear the continued dying, death, suffering. And it just seems like such a darkness and oppression of evil and sin and suffering. And so our world does need a light. And so as for us who witness to who Jesus is, we get to point and say, 
hey, there is a light, there's good news, but there is bad news. Our world is filled with darkness, but there is a light that comes in who God is. But I want to focus on one key verse uh, for us today, which comes at our end of our passage, which is, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, this word, word, we've actually seen earlier. Let me go back and point out a little bit of what it means. Because we had it three times already. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Well, this word in the original language is quite a deep, uh, has a lot of meaning. In Greek, this would mean logos, which can mean word. It can mean message. We've been talking about message. It can also mean reason. That is, there's a, a logic and a meaning about the whole world. And if you... Uh, understand Chinese, and you realize when they had to translate this, they had to search far and wide to think about what word can capture this, to have a meaning, a logic, a reason, a way. And this is the same word they use in, in Taoism for the way. Okay? And this word, uh, this message, uh, God doesn't just leave as words or a Bible. Well, what we see in our key verse is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. At the core of Christianity, and in Christmas in about six weeks' time, this is the core of what we understand what Jesus did. God takes his message and wraps it in flesh to come amongst us. What some people would call our toxic world, God doesn't stay at a distance and say, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. But God actually sends his son as a messenger with the message into our dark, perhaps toxic world to come and redeem and save it. Oh, to take on flesh. Brothers and sisters, we are vulnerable as people of flesh. We might be really excited about sharing the gospel t this week, but tomorrow one of us might wake up with a stomach ache, and guess what? We're, we ain't sharing the gospel that day. We're lying in bed all day. To be of flesh is such an incredible thing because it's our, it's our creatureliness. It's our limitations. But this is part of God's plan, is to take his own son and make him a vulnerable human being that can be hurt, that can be tortured, that can be killed. And same with us. He chooses us as vulnerable beings of flesh. And this is the story of how that happens. Now, when we think about also this word, this word dwelt, and I'm pointing out some of the uh, extra Greek to give us a bit of meaning, a bit more meaning. When you think about what does it mean by became flesh? Uh, the word in Greek can mean to dwell. It can mean to set up a tent or tabernacle. Okay, now, if you know your Old Testament, tabernacle would be a place people would come to meet God. That was the holy, sacred place that we would go to meet God. And so when we read this in the New Testament, what is the Bible saying? It's Jesus comes and sets up his holiness in flesh. It's as if the temple of God came down in a human being. And that's who Jesus is. He is the walking tabernacle of God. He's the walking temple. And as Jesus comes to us, his light shines out throughout the world. And he actually shares that with you and I. And together, we become the people of God. We are called to be the light of the world. And so this will help us understand why, although we worship here at our church as a sacred space, we can worship anywhere. And when Jesus came and said, it doesn't matter if a temple or a mountain uh, the worship of God can happen everywhere because I have brought the sacredness. I have tabernacled amongst you. I've set up God's holiness and presence among us. Brothers and sisters, that's the mystery of what we call the incarnation, Jesus taking on flesh and being amongst us. How can it be? How can the God who hung the stars in the sky, who's so holy, take on our brokenness and flesh and be amongst us? You know, over these next few months, we're going to have a lot more baby noises uh, in every English service and be reminded of what flesh looks like. And that's the path that God chose to show us who he is, was to walk that same path. And so when you think about this verse, try to imagine God's holy temple coming down and being amongst us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as Jesus did that, what happened is people start to understand who God is. And that was the promise. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. Why were people so drawn to Jesus? It's because there was a holiness about him that he, he in his life, both in his words and action, he embodied God's glory and they understood truth and grace as coming from the man, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, Jesus embodied the message. He took God's words in heart and then showed it amongst you and I. And that's the calling we have too. In the same way that Jesus took on and dwelt and tabernacled God's message, so are we called to do that too. And so the reading that Peter read to us from Philippians uh, showed us in the first half, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That is, Paul's encouraging us, the way we live our lives ought to live up to the very message that Jesus has for us. And so when Paul says, when I come to see you again, I hope that I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not frightened in anything by your opponents. And then it goes on to even talk about suffering. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so as Jesus lived out the message, being a light in a world of darkness, he suffered and faced many things. And brothers and sisters, that's the good and bad news. We are called to be the light of the world, a wonderful calling and anointing. But we will also walk in the path of Christ, and we will face different kinds of suffering um, and different kinds of opponents even. Well, as we think about Jesus, and we would not be here if Jesus had not come and taken on a flesh, uh, today I'm also going to give us some small group time. So in a couple, in just a minute here, I'm going to invite you to be into groups of two or three with those around you. Introduce yourself, and I want you to share uh, this question with one another, okay? Jesus came to earth and became flesh, limiting himself from God to a human, limited in time and space. During that time, he shared God's message in both words and actions to those around him. So the question I want you to reflect on and mix around a little bit and talk to the people around you, who is someone in your life who doesn't know Jesus that you might be called to share the gospel with? So we've been doing this five-part series on sharing God and his message, and it could just be a nice theoretical idea. Oh, okay, Alan, we've spent these five weeks. I can understand what it means to share God and to share his message. Uh, but we're going to challenge one another to actually not just have this message in our brains, but actually to embody it, to put our feet into it. And so I want you to think about different people in your life. Maybe they've heard a little bit about God, I don't know, but they're not Christians or maybe never heard about Jesus. Who do you think are maybe one or two people in your life that you are connected a bit to, that perhaps God has called you to be a witness, to be the message with flesh, to be a human being, witnessing to who God is around you, okay? So I know some of you say when family members, I encourage you to break up then a little bit. I think it's nice for us to mix a little bit and be in groups of two or three. And I want you to share maybe one or two names of someone you can think of, okay? So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to do that. <laughs> 
All right, just one more minute, and then we're going to come back together. Why are you guys smiling at me? Okay, the last person can finish up and then we'll return to our seats. I hope that was a helpful exercise to actually really think about who is in your proximity. Is it that neighbor, that coworker, that family member, or that person you've lost touch with, but maybe you sense some interest in them to understand who God is. Um, and we're going to be praying for that uh, in a little time. And Part of our five-week series, and we'll t I'll talk more about this next week, is how do we as a congregation then support each other in this? What I loved about this little exercise is we probably have names in the back of our mind, but actually say their name to someone else, to share that with a few other people, I think it'd be very meaningful because it kind of spreads a little bit of a spark. <laughs> it's one thing to just have one person have an idea, but actually share, oh, there's someone in my life named Joe, and I've wondered about, you know? And I was sharing with my group, there's a neighbor named Ethan. And uh, my wife and I wondered, oh, this person seems to be put in our life. And we wonder about, are we the person who may have a chance to share the gospel with them? So I hope as you share names, uh, that is a meaningful thing. And why, how are we going to build that? Something's going to happen next week. Next week, what we're going to do is share, a couple years ago, uh, there was an experience of us doing an outreach Bible study. And what that meant is we went from just thinking about a message and things like that to actually thinking, how do we share and embody this message among each other? So I'm going to give you a little bit of sneak peek. These are some of the people you may recognize from our, our own church when we had an online outreach Bible study. And through that outreach Bible study, I think a lot of people were encouraged. We shared God's message. Some people came to become believers, which we'll hear a little bit about. Some people heard a bit, and I think some seeds were planted in their hearts. And uh, I hope next week will be a, a very concrete example of how do we think about embodying and sharing the message with one another. And then how are we going to do get together as a congregation? Well, let's go back to our controversial quote. Preach the gospel at all times. St. Francis wants us to be sharing who God is and sharing his message at all times. And in his take, he thinks, when necessary, use words. Well, I think it is a controversial quote, and as I said, there's some things I agree with, some things I a little bit disagree with. But I think today as we think about how do we embody the message, it does capture something very important. Jesus didn't want to just talk at us. He instead took on flesh and lived the message amongst you and I. Jesus wanted to show us who is God and what is his message. And today being a Holy Communion service, one of the clearest ways we see the real stuff of Jesus is that we don't just remember in our minds, oh yeah, Jesus did this, he died for us. As Christians, we have a ritual and a practice to take of the bread and take of the cup. At Holy Communion, we see the two coming together, the words and message of Jesus and the embodiment of the message. Jesus did both in his whole life, both through his words and his actions. He spoke to his people, reminding them, this is my body, which is broken for you. Brothers and sisters, as we come later, that is the bread of salvation. Jesus also took the cup and said these words, this is my blood shed for you. Brothers and sisters, as you come forward, it is a cup of salvation. Jesus spoke these words, but then after speaking the words, he hung on the cross wordlessly, but spoke a powerful message beyond his words. Let's pray. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we thank you that you took on flesh and dwelt among us. You tabernacled amongst us. You set up uh, your holiness and presence among us. We thank you that you embodied um, the message, and through you we see the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I pray for each one of us that we would know you more as the embodiment of our faith, and the message of Christianity. Lord, we pray for the names that were listed just a few minutes ago.
that you would put these people on our heart. You would give us an opportunity to share who you are in your message. And Lord, will we do that in words and action? We ask in Christ's name. Amen.